Hello and welcome to the program. Now, Ukraine's parliament has approved a new law on ensuring the functioning of Ukrainian as a state language. Now, the law stipulates state and government affairs generally should be conducted in Ukrainian, but doesn't restrict the language used in private communication or religious ceremonies. Now, pleased to say to talk more about this, we're joined in the studio today by Maxim Kobilev. He's a member of the expert group on language policy under the cabinet of ministers of Ukraine. Ukraine. Hi, Maxime. Thank you so much for coming in. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm sure you've had your work cut out, not over just the past yeah. few days, but over yeah. the past few months Definitely. with this uh, particular law. Um, I want to start by talking about uh, one aspect I thought was quite interesting, and it was the fact that many uh, media outlets were reporting that the law means that Ukrainian is now the only official state language. But as far as I'm aware, this has always been the case anyway. So what's the difference between what Ukraine had before and what it has now? Yeah, exactly. As you have said, uh, Ukrainian language has always been the only official, the only state language in Ukraine uh, ever since we gained independence in 1991. Uh, the issue is that uh, up until now, uh, the status of the state law has been merely de declarative. It hasn't been like protected by uh, any specific uh, regulation by any specific requirements uh, of the law and actually it was just a declaration that we have a state law and that's it but mm. anyone can use including the i don't know the the uh, ministers of the cabinet of ministers could use any uh, language even during their work uh, or etc oh so ukrainian was just the language of choice that they've been using yeah yeah, yeah exactly um, I'd like to break it down because there's so many different aspects to this particular law. I think it'd be good to talk about uh, media, uh, first of all, because uh, as far as I remember, it's about 90% now of all uh, TV and radio content should be in Ukrainian. Yeah. And um, that was, I think it was 50% before, there was another... It was 70, actually. 70, sorry, yeah. 70%. Um, so now it's up to 90. So uh, firstly, how is this possible to enforce and uh, also what sort of effect does that have on media outlets? For example, ones that perhaps don't have the budgetary um, availability to be able to afford to have a, a Russian language site and a Ukrainian language site, for example. Okay, so if we're uh, talking about the media, uh, I guess we should break it down again into some smaller pieces mm -hmm. because there are different articles in the law, uh, specifically about the the, uh, for example, websites, mm. uh, about the uh, TV and radio, and also about the printed press. So uh, if we are talking about the uh, television, for example, uh, there is not much, uh, th not much to change, because actually uh, the parliament has already adopted a, a law uh, that enforces the usage of Ukrainian language on the TV uh, at a certain percentage, which is uh, 70 by now, and it's going to change uh, to 90 for the uh, for the TV uh, channels that uh, cover the whole country. Mm. Uh, but again, this uh, change is going to take uh, into effect only, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in five years after the uh, the uh, the law itself uh, takes into effect. Yeah, and that's quite important as well because uh, these uh, TV channels yeah. and uh, media outlets and uh, other organisations, in fact, need time to be yes. able to change exactly. this sort of thing. And actually, this is not uh, like a huge change, at least if we're talking specifically about television, uh, because uh, we're talking about like 90%, but actually mm. uh, effectively it's not going to be uh, even 80%, it's going to be much less uh, because there are lots of exclusions from the, uh, fr from the definition of mm. what is like a Ukrainian, a, a program in Ukrainian language and all of these uh, exclusions or exceptions uh, are are uh, currently valid, they're, they're uh, like present in the current law on mm. the television. Uh, and this is not going to be like drastical change yeah. actually. Because that's why with this law, it's so difficult to make general statements because yeah. there's different yeah. examples for Ukrainian media, 
for yeah. foreign media that operate in Ukraine, perhaps media that operate in other languages as yes, well. Yes, lots, lots of different exceptions, lots of different articles, uh, lots of different uh, stuff that we need to take into account while uh, talking about all this stuff. And actually, uh, there is even more because uh, there have been lots of uh, different uh, stages of the draft law and at different stages there were different suggestions and different uh, different editions actually of the draft law and uh, all of them had like different kinds of regulations different numbers etc mm. and, and then we get to talk more about the different aspects of the law in uh, a few minutes but i wanted to ask you about the broad aim of this uh, new law um, what do you hope to achieve? Do you hope to, say, for example, strengthen the national uh, Ukrainian identity? Is that one of the purposes that's in the law? Or? Uh, probably yes, but it's. Uh, I wouldn't say that this is like the main uh, purpose of the law. Uh, at least from my personal perspective, uh, the main uh, aim of the law is and has always been uh, to let the people uh, the Ukrainians and not just Ukrainians, but also the foreigners who study, for example, Ukrainian uh, mm. in their home countries and then come uh, to Ukraine, to let them uh, just have an ability to get public services in Ukrainian because uh, probably most of the people abroad, they don't know uh, about like the, the real situation in Ukraine, but uh, it's quite too often, even in the capital in Kyiv and also in most of the uh, big uh, industrial cities of the Ukraine, mm. that you just go to a cafe, for example, or to a restaurant, you ask for a menu in Ukrainian, in the state language again, and the, the language that is spoken by the majority of the citizens in Ukraine, and uh, the restaurant staff just refuses to uh, you to give uh, a menu in Ukrainian just because they don't have it. Mm. And in my opinion, this is like this is not right. This is not good. Uh, anyone should be able to uh, receive at least a minimum set of information in Ukrainian uh, in Ukraine. Yeah, and uh, obviously that goes to universities as well. So does that mean, for example, at educational institutions, lectures and teaching in general must be in Ukrainian? Yes, actually, uh, even now and throughout the whole uh, time of the independent Ukraine, uh, teaching in Ukrainian in universities and also in schools, uh, except for the uh, minority uh, schools, uh, so teaching in Ukrainian was f also enforced by the law, mm. but uh, this was way too often violated and is still violated. Uh, so how are you going to enforce this particular law? I mean, is there anything in the law that explains um, how you're going to enforce this or what sort of penalties there could be if uh, it's ignored? Uh, well, this is a good question. Uh, what is different, like uh, between what is the difference between uh, the new law mm. and all the laws that we uh, were having since the since we gained the independence? Uh, earlier on, we were having the laws uh, with some declarative stuff again. That, for example, uh, everyone has the right to get education in Ukrainian in Ukraine, for example. Mm. Yeah. But this has never been really enforced. There were no fines uh, prescribed by the law. There were no, uh, there, there were no uh, mechanisms uh, of controlling uh, the execution of the law. The, no one actually, monit no one actually mon uh, ever monitored uh, if the law uh, was being uh, adhered to so in Ukraine. once uh, this law uh, comes into force, once it is signed, and then yes. obviously there's a three-year period, I think, where um, institutions can make adaptations to yes, the, their the, own There systems. are different yeah. uh, time periods for different spheres, but the, the main thing is that uh, once the law uh, takes into effect and uh, these periods uh, pass, then uh, the institutions uh, that are specialized on uh, controlling and more monitoring the uh, adherence to the law uh, will be, be created and will, uh, will start working. And this is what uh, is actually different from, all the, uh, f from the situation that we actually had during the, the last few decades. 
And also, uh, again, we are going to have uh, the responsibility, the fines. Uh, they are not that big, but still, uh, in my opinion, since uh, lots of businesses in Ukraine still uh, didn't have a chance to uh, to provide, for example, uh, Ukrainian menus again, mm. uh, this would be like a stimuli for them to, to finally think about it. Yeah. And um, I guess uh, my next question is generally about uh, business as well, because um, a lot of uh, business is done in Russian in Ukraine. Yeah. That's It's no yeah. secret. Yeah. Um, in, if you go no, east of Kiev, yeah. go to Dnipropetrovsk, if you yes. go to Zaporizhia, um, a lot of the schooling is done in Russian because that's what people speak at home. So um, why is the new law necessary? Instead, perhaps other laws, older laws could have been adapted. Say, for example, what's so special about this particular law? Is it because it covers everything? Or? Uh, yes, first of all, it covers everything. Uh, then again, it has mechanisms for controlling everything, uh, for controlling the uh, the implementation of the law. Uh, it has uh, different kinds of sanctions. And also, actually, right now we don't, ha we don't have uh, a law on the languages or a law on the official language at all. Yeah, because as uh, far as I'm aware, in schools across Ukraine, some schools teach in Russian, some in Ukrainian. Uh, actually, they're some all, mix. Uh, they should teach in Ukrainian. They mm. can uh, teach some of the subjects in Russian, yes, but they should uh, still teach in Ukrainian. But way too often they don't do mm. because no one is controlling that, no one is monitoring that. The government has never actually uh, put enough effort into enforcing this stuff. Yeah, and I, actually I, I read part of the law and I think uh, there's the initiative that the government should provide some sort of platform to allow yeah. foreigners yeah. to learn Ukrainian. Yeah, exactly. And I know the Ministry of Information yes. Policy, yeah. which UATV is a part of, has the, this uh, platform Speak Ukrainian. Yeah. And uh, I've looked at it and it's actually like pretty good, you know, and there's not many resources like this out there. Yeah, and uh, sure, the government should uh, also provide the means to, uh, for the foreigners and not just for the foreigners, but also for the citizens of Ukraine who uh, like want to increase their uh, level of knowledge of Ukrainian language. The government should provide uh, like the, the, the means, the ways to do it. And this is also uh, prescribed by the law to, uh, that the government uh, should create uh, a certain kind of uh, courses for Ukrainian language mm. so that people can use them. Yeah, and this is useful because uh, there's very few modern Ukrainian textbooks out there. I know I've looked myself and most of them are from like, the 1970s or yes, 1980s yes. with uh, old grammar and, yeah. uh, you know. The problem is that we have never had uh, like uh, real demand for this because most of people unfortunately in Ukraine they just thought ah oh, I don't need Ukrainian because even though it's my native language because mm. Ukrainian is native for uh, more than 72 uh, uh, sorry uh, uh, 78 percent of uh, the Ukrainian citizens but still like no one needs Ukrainian in Ukraine, so why should I bother uh, like speaking it? Because if I speak uh, Russian, uh, I can go to any job, I can, uh, like, uh, I don't know, go to the government even yeah. and uh, be a head of uh, a ministry, for example, and just no one cares, so why bother? And this is actually the practice that has been uh, created and introduced into Ukraine during the uh, Soviet period, mm. during the Soviet occupation. And uh, since we are currently having, uh, we are currently at war with Russia, who is actually uh, like uh, a successor of the uh, Soviet Union, we need to protect ourselves mm. uh, from the threat. Uh, and actually, uh, unfortunately enough, but uh, Russia is still using the Russian language uh, as uh, as an arm, as a tool. Uh, yes, almost, as a yeah. tool to, to to invade Ukraine, to uh, to invade Ukrainian, uh, to invade the uh, the brains of the Ukrainians. Was well, the, the information war? Yes, isn't it, yes, yes, exactly. But also, it's it's good as well within the law that goods and services as well will be in Ukrainian because I would imagine still a lot aren't. Yes, uh, but actually, uh, like this is not just about uh, enforcing that all of the services are uh, exclusively in Ukrainian. The issue is that 
uh, whenever uh, a person speaking Ukrainian uh, and wanting uh, to be served in Ukrainian comes into a shop, for example, and mm. asks to be served in Ukrainian, then he should be served in Ukrainian according to this law. Uh, if a person speaking English or Spanish or Chinese or Russian uh, comes to a shop and tries to get service in uh, the corresponding language, it's not a problem at all. Mm. Uh, and uh, the law does not forbid it, of course. Uh, it's not a problem. Go on. You yeah. can serve in Russian, in uh, Chinese, in English, any language you like. But if uh, a person speaking Ukrainian comes in, please do serve him in Ukrainian because he uh, has never had such a chance uh, during the last decades. Yeah. And so we need to revive really. the, the, the an, language. It's an agreement between the customer and, yes. uh, and the seller or the, the, the business. It's and, actually yeah. like an agreement uh, between the citizens, actually, mm. but, uh, that like everyone can know, uh, can speak any language you like, but uh, you should know Ukrainian at least at a certain level so that we can communicate at least some basic stuff between yeah. ourselves. Well, that's good. Hopefully I should uh, pass that test. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, so. I have one uh, final question for you as well about uh, the new uh, language ombudsperson yeah. who's going to be appointed. What's going to be their role? The role of this, uh, I would say, like the, the commissioner uh, for the protection of the state language. Uh, the role, the role of this person is to actually uh, make sure that the law is actually being adhered to mm -hmm. by the businesses, by the, I don't know, chairs people, by the officials, uh, by the president, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. Because, again, as I have already said, the problem has been uh, during the last decades that we were having an official language, but we were having just a declarative uh, status uh, and even the ministers, even the current minister of the uh, the, the domestic minister mm. does not speak Ukrainian even uh, while giving interviews to Ukrainian TV channels. Yeah. This is nonsense. And uh, this law uh, makes it possible uh, to for, for the people and for the society to gradually adopt Ukrainian language. It, it doesn't enforce it actually. It just provides the... It's like uh, an like, avenue like, almost yes, to use it more. It's like a fundament, uh, for, 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 uh, like, a, like a base. Yeah. If you want, then okay, the government pro uh, provides you with the means, the uh, government provides you with, uh, like, uh, with the environment to study, to practice Ukrainian. Mm. If you don't want, okay, no problem. Okay, we'll have to leave it there. Maxime, thank you so much for thank coming you. to our studio. It was a pleasure. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. That was Maxim Kobylev, a member of the expert group on language policy under the Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more here on UA TV.